chemical letters, instructions for a human being, my eyes glaze over. <laughs> but when scientist Eric Lander looks at this, he sees stories. The genome is a storybook that's been edited for a couple billion years. And you couldn't take it to bed like a thousand and one Arabian nights and read a different story in the genome every night. This is the story of one of the greatest scientific adventures ever. And at the heart of it is a small, very powerful molecule, DNA. For the past 10 years, scientists all over the world have been painstakingly trying to read the tiny instructions buried inside our DNA. And now, finally, the human genome has been decoded. We're at the moment the scientists wait for. This is what we wanted to do. You know, we're now examining and interpreting the genetic code. This is the ultimate imaginable thing that one could do scientifically, is to go and look at our own instruction book and then try to figure out what it's telling us. And what it's telling us is so surprising and so strange and so unexpected. 50% of the genes in a banana are How enough? different are you from a banana? I feel, and I feel I can say this with some authority, very different from a banana. You may feel different. I from eat a banana. a banana. All the machinery for replicating your DNA, all the machinery for controlling the cell cycle, the cell surface, for making uh, nutrients, all that's the same. So what does any of this information have to do with you or me? Perhaps more than we could possibly imagine. Which one of us will get cancer? or arthritis, or Alzheimer's? Will there be cures? Will parents in the future be able to determine their children's genetic destinies? We've opened the box here that has got a huge amount of valuable information. It is the key to understanding disease and in the long run to curing disease. But having opened it, we're also going to be very uncomfortable with that information for some time to come. To begin, let's go back four and some billion years ago to wherever it was that the first speck of life appeared on Earth. Maybe on the warm surface of a bubble. That speck did something that has gone on uninterrupted ever since. It wrote a message. It was a chemical message that it passed to its children, which then passed it on to its children and to its children and so on. The message has passed from the very first organism all the way down through time to you and me. Like a continuous thread through all living things. It's more elaborate now, of course, but that message, very simply, is the secret of life. And here is that message contained in this stunning little constellation of chemicals we call DNA. You've seen it in this form, the classic double helix, but since we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about DNA, I wondered what does it look like when it's raw, you know, in real life? So I ask an expert. I mean, DNA is a, is, is, has a reputation for being such a mystical, highfalutin sort of molecule, all this information, your future, your heredity. It's actually goop. See, this here is DNA. Yeah. Professor Eric Lander yeah. is a geneticist at MIT's Whitehead Institute. It's very, very long strands of, of molecules, these double helices of DNA, which when you get them all together, just look like little threads of cotton. And these strands were literally pulled from cells, blood cells, or maybe skin cells, of a human being. Whoever contributed this DNA, you can tell from this whether or not they might be at early risk for Alzheimer's disease. You can tell whether or not they might be at early risk for breast cancer. And there's probably about 2,000 other things you can tell that we don't know how to tell yet, but we'll be able to tell. And it's really incredibly unlikely that you could tell all that from this. But that's DNA for you. That's, that apparently is the secret of life, just hanging off there on the, on the tube. 
And already, DNA has told us things that no one, no one had expected. It turns out that human beings have only twice as many genes as a fruit fly. Now, how can that be? We are such complex and magnificent creatures, and fruit flies, well, uh, they're fruit flies. DNA also tells us that we are more closely related to worms and to yeast than most of us would ever have imagined. But how do you read what's inside a molecule? Well, if it's DNA, if you turn it so you can look at it from just the right angle, you will see in the middle what look like steps in a ladder. Each step is made up of two chemicals, cytosine and guanine, or thymine and adenine. They come always in pairs called base pairs, either C and G, or T and A for short. This is, step by step, a code, three billion steps long, the formula for a human being. We're all familiar with this thing. This shape is very familiar. Double helix. Yep. Double helix. <clears throat> First of all, I'm wondering, this is my version of a DNA molecule. Is this, by the way, what it looks like? Well, give or take. I mean, cartoon version cartoon of it. Cartoon version. Yeah, you know, a little like that or so, yeah. So there are, in every, in almost every cell in your body, if you look yeah. deep enough, you will find this, this chain here. Oh, yes. Stuck in the nucleus of your cell. Now, how small is this? If in a real DNA molecule, the distance between the two walls is how wide? Oh, golly. Look at this. He's up. asking for help. <laughs> this distance is about uh, from from this distance about ten angstroms, which is that's one billionth of a meter when it's clumped up in a very particular way. Well, no, it's, it's curled up some like that, but you see, it's more than that. You can't curl it up too much because these little negatively charged things will repel each other. Oh. So you fold it on its. I'm going to break your model. model yeah, don't break my model. I don't want to break your model. You know, it gets. It, you got this, and then it's folded up like this, and then those are folded up on top of each other. And so, in fact, if you were to stretch out all of the DNA, it would run. Oh, I don't know. You know, thousands and thousands of feet. Okay. But what the main thing about this is the ladder is the steps of this ladder. If I knew it was A and T and C and C and G and G and A, oh, no, I not might, G and G. I'm sorry, G whatever C. the rules are. The grammar. Yeah, right. yeah. If I could read each of the individual ladders, I might find the picture of what? Of, well, of your children. This of is what children. you pass to your children. Oh. You know, people have known for two thousand years that your kids look a lot like you. Yeah. Well, it's because you must pass them something, some instructions that give them the eyes they have and the hair color they have and the nose shape they do. The only way you pass it to them is in these sentences. That's it. And to show you the true power of this molecule, we're going to start with one atom deep inside. We pull back and you see it form its A's and T's and C's and G's and the classic double spiral. And then it starts the mysterious process that creates a healthy new baby. And the interesting thing is that every human baby, every baby born, is 99.9% .9 identical in its genetic code to every other baby. So the tiniest differences in our genes can be hugely important, can contribute to differences in height, physique, maybe even talents, aptitudes, and can also explain what can break, what can make us sick. Cracking the code of those minuscule differences in DNA that influence health and illness is what the Human Genome Project is all about. 
Since 1990, scientists all over the world and university and government labs have been involved in a massive effort to read all three billion A's, T's, G's, and C's of human DNA. They predicted it would take at least 15 years. That was partly because in the early days of the project, a scientist could spend years, an entire career, trying to read just a handful of letters in the human genome. It took 10 years to find the one genetic mistake that causes cystic fibrosis. Another 10 years to find the gene for Huntington's disease. 15 years to find one of the genes that increase the risk for breast cancer. One letter at a time, painfully, slowly, frustratingly prone to mistakes and false leads. We asked Dr. Robert Waterston, a pioneer in mapping DNA, to show us the way it used to be done. The original ladders for DNA sequence, we actually read by putting a little uh, letter next to the band that we were calling and then uh, writing those down on a piece of paper or into the computer after that. Uh, it's horrendous. And we haven't mentioned the hardest part. This here magnified 50,000 times as an actual clump of DNA, chromosome 17. Now, if you look inside, you will find, of course, hundreds of millions of A's and C's and T's and G's, but it turns out that only about 1% of them are active and important. These are the genes that scientists are searching for. So somewhere in this dense chemical forest are genes involved in deafness, Alzheimer's, cancer, cataracts, but where? This is such a maze, scientists need a map. But at the old pace, that would take close to forever. A C and then an A. And then came the revolution. In the last 10 years, the entire process has been computerized. That costs hundreds of millions of dollars. But now, instead of decoding only a few hundred letters by hand in a day, together these machines can do a thousand every second. And that has made all the difference. This is something that's going to go in the textbooks. Everybody knows that. Everybody, when the Genome Project was being born, was consciously aware of their role in history. Getting the letters out is, has been described as finding the blueprint of a human being, finding a manual for a human being, finding the code of a human being. What's your metaphor? Oh, golly gee. I mean, I, I, you, you can have very highfalutin metaphors for this kind of stuff. This is basically a parts list, right? Blueprints and all these things, it's just a parts list. It's a parts list with a lot of parts. If you take an airplane, a Boeing 777, yeah. I think it has like 100,000 parts. If I gave you a parts list for the Boeing 777, in one sense, you'd know a lot. You'd know 100,000 components that have got to be there, screws and wires and you know, rudders and things like that. On the other hand, um, I bet you wouldn't know how to put it together, and I bet you wouldn't know why it flies. Right. Well, we're in the same boat. We now have a parts list. That's what the Human Genome Project is about, is getting the parts list. If you want to understand the plane, you have to have the parts list, but that's not enough to understand why it flies. But of course, you'd be crazy not to start with the parts list. And one reason it's so important to understand all those parts, to decode every letter of the genome, is because sometimes, out of three billion base pairs in our DNA, just one single letter can make a difference.